And I have to make the point that I love Jehovah's Witnesses, but I'm not crazy about the organization. <laughs> so I don't mind um, speaking about the organization. I'm privileged to be speaking here today. It, I've been coming here for 12 years, and I never foresaw that I would be up here, but it's such a privilege to be here, and it's such a um, a blessing to be among you friends. You know, we hear ex-witnesses all the time say how that um, they wouldn't miss being here because of the closeness of the family, of the shared experience, but it's kind of the same with um, those of us who have never been witnesses that have been coming here. You are my family as well, you know, after all these years, and we have something in common I really appreciated Keith's message earlier, you know, because he's never been a witness either. And so God gave him this crazy, unexplainable love for Jehovah's Witnesses too. But the one way we're different is that he said that he started off with a love for arguing <laughs> and came to love the Jehovah's Witnesses. With me, I love the Jehovah's Witnesses that I met, and I still don't like to argue. <laughs> It doesn't appeal to me. Now, I'm not bad at it. I'm not too bad at it. I'm pretty good at debating and arguing, but I don't like it. It doesn't appeal to me. I like peace and harmony and, and all that kind of stuff. So my son likes to argue and my husband likes to argue, so I'm surrounded by them all. When I first came here, when we first came here 12 years ago, we were looking for that magic bullet. I knew a lot at that time already. I had already read many, many books, and I had listened to myriads of tapes, and I had, you know, just, I was full of it, and I had learned how to how to use the Bible and how to defend the faith and all that, but I was looking for that one way. I was looking for that one thing, that magic bullet that I could, some method that I could use to share with Jehovah's Witnesses that would work, and they would come out, you know, and I'm still looking. <laughs> you know, Joyce Kilmer, uh, did a poem where she said, um, only God can make a tree, and, and I think that only God can free someone from bondage as well. And all we can do is prepare ourselves the best that we can and be God's willing instruments. So we, we get a lot of calls from people, from Christians, that they get Jehovah's Witnesses coming or they want to learn about it. And we get a lot of calls from people who say, this has happened many times, where they'll say, Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be at our door in half an hour. What do I say? <laughs> oh, dear. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? So, you know, I ask him, well, what, you know, do you, do you know your Bible very well? Can you defend the faith from, from the Bible? Well, I, I guess so. I've, I've gone to church all my life. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, okay, well, what do you know about the organization? Do you know about, you know, their past? Do you know about their pagan roots? Do you know about the false prophecies? Do you know any of that stuff? Well, my mom's neighbor is a Jehovah's Witness. I'm like, oh, dear. Here we go. So here's what I tell them. I tell them, this is what you say. Come back in a few weeks. <laughs> After I get a chance to uh, to look over, you know, and figure out what I'm going to say. Because it's not something that you can just, there is no magic bullet. You know, and if, when you get into ministry and you're learning all these methods and people are telling you all this, you can get very discouraged very quickly. Because you hear, oh, this is the way. Okay, I'll try that, you know. And there is no one way to deal with, with everyone. So what I'm going to present today is just one topic that you can use with Jehovah's Witnesses that I have found very effective, both online and in print and, and uh, just in talking with them. It, it seems to, I use um, Keith's method of asking questions and let them uh, give the answer. So if you want to start that, this is called The Wheat and the Weeds. It's about the false history of the Washington organization. What do Jehovah's Witnesses have their faith in? Put faith in a victorious organization, or as they say in other places, come to Jehovah's organization for salvation. You know, they're always talking about organization, organization, organization. And that's what they have their faith in. So when you're going to talk to a Jehovah's Witness, you can't just present them with the Bible, because they have blinders on. They're blind to the truth. They can't really see it, as, as uh, most of you in this room know. It's very difficult. 
You want to change the player? So how do we typically try to shape their idolatrous faith in the organization so that the person can hear the gospel? Well, what we do is we try to tell them about the history. We try to tell them about um, the pagan roots, you know, and all those kind of things. But what what's the problem? Next slide. Problem. How do JWs respond when you present them with the false prophecies, the pagan roots, the changing doctrines? or other problems within the uh, Watchtower Society. They come up with this new light excuse. Switch to slide. That's old stuff. I don't care what C.T. Russell said or what Rutherford said in the 30s and 40s or what the organization taught in 1950, 1975, or even 1999. Our leaders have received new light. I only want to talk about what we teach now. Now, at the same time, in his bag or in her bag, She's got the latest watchtower, and what's in the latest watchtower? All this talk about the Inquisition, the Crusades, <laughs> stuff that happened centuries ago. And they don't mind bringing up that, but they don't want to talk about something that happened 10 years ago. They don't want to talk about something 15 years ago. So to solve the problem, we have to find a way to show them the glaring dishonesty of the organization while at the same time addressing and debunking the phony new light excuse. And my favorite topic to talk to them about is the faithful and discreet slave. Who is the faithful and discreet slave? It's the organization. It's the anointed. It's, it's, it's everything. You know, it's the Pope, basically, of Jehovah's Witnesses. Supposedly comprised of all the elite anointed class alive on earth, the faithful and discreet slave is in reality a pseudonym for the leadership, the governing body of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. The, the slave is the pope of Jehovah's organization. You've got people that, you know, how many anointed are there supposed to be on earth now? Some 9,000 or something like that. And yet these, the vast majority of these thousands of people have no more to say about Jehovah's Witness doctrine than I do. You know, they have nothing to say. So it's a phony. It's completely phony. And the only real part of the slave is the people in Brooklyn, the governing body. When did Jehovah's Organization come into being? If you ask me, after I've studied the Jehovah's Witnesses, I'd say, well, Charles Hayes Russell founded it, started uh, printing the Watchtower magazine in 1879. So that's when I would say that the organization started. Although the 1993 history book, Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, traces the history of the Washtar Society back to the 1870s and no further, it at the same time asserts that there were witnesses of Jehovah in the first century, that Jehovah's organization was established by Jesus Christ at Pentecost in 33 AD. Russell merely restored uh, true Christianity after long, dark centuries of apostasy. Okay, they claim that the, the early Christian church was a mirror image of the present day organization, complete with the slave, the governing body, feeding the flock, food at the proper time, running the show from Jerusalem, no doubt making sure no one took blood transfusions or celebrated a birthday. Okay, the great apostasy in the, in the July 1, 1994 watchtower under the heading Weed and Weeds, there appears this statement. Jesus himself taught that true Christianity would disappear from view. Huh? Is that so? Did Jesus teach that? Did Jesus teach that that uh, the Christians, that the wheat would disappear from view? No. All Jesus said was that the true and false Christians would grow together until the harvest at the end of the age and that the weeds would be left in the field until then for the sake of the wheat. He didn't say anything about it disappearing. But they need to talk about the disappearance because they have to have some explanation for the fact that all those centuries there were no Jehovah's Witnesses or people that taught Jehovah's Witness doctrine. So, <laughs> the governing body wins the Pinocchio Award. <laughs> Just think of me as the Pope without the big hat. <laughs> The disappearing wheat deception sets the table for the famous great apostasy fairy tale, which is necessary to explain the embarrassing absence of JWs in the historical record of the last two millennia. It's like what Jim was sharing with us last night, how that all the doctrines 
you know, lean on each other and fit together. You have to tell one lie, so now you have to tell another lie, and then you have to tell another lie, and then you have to tell another lie. So it's lie upon lie. And yet they say that even though uh, the slave was invisible, it wasn't entirely gone. Speaking rather admirably, admiringly of Tyndale, Whitecliffe, and other historical figures, the Proclaimer's Book on page 44 states that true Christianity then was never completely stamped out, although we cannot positively identify any of such persons as the wheat of Jesus' illustration, certainly Jehovah knows those who belong to him. Does Jehovah ever work through individuals? But does he? According to JW Doctrine? Does, no, never. Never. So how could they possibly say that we don't know whether those people were Jehovah's Witnesses? Of course they weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. There was, they weren't a part of an organization. They, so that's another little bit of baloney there. God has always used an organization. February 15, 1983, Watchtower, page 12. This is the two-story, two-step is what I call it. And a um, man by the name of Ron Fry did a, a talk on this topic, and I heard it. Uh, about the conflicting stories, and it's been so useful to me. I wanted to make sure and give him credit because uh, it truly you can you can uh, jump off of almost any discussion and bring this up. No matter what no matter what the topic is, you can find a way to fit this in. The Watchtower Society teaches both of these contradictory stories of fact, toggling back and forth between the two as needed. Story number one: the Great Apostasy fairy tale. True Christianity apostatized soon after the death of the apostles. The apostasy did not take place all at once, but involved a synchronization process that came about like this. After Christ's apostles died, their followers began slowly to mix elements of the true faith with elements of paganism. This resulted in a totally apostate church, aka the evil Christendom, within a few centuries' time. True Christians, the weak, still existed on earth, but they were independent individuals scattered here and there among Christendom's various denominations and movements, and no one can say for a certainty who they are. Okay, that's story number one, the great apostasy. Story number two is the ever-loyal, faithful, and discreet slave. True Christianity never really apostatized at all. The true Christians, the wheat, the Christ-appointed F&D slave, were a cohesive group that remain loyal and pure down through the centuries, one generation of the slave faithfully feeding the next. Being found faithful, this is important, being found faithful at Christ's return in 1914, the slave was rewarded by being appointed over all the master's belongings. Imitation Christians, the weeds, Christendom must, appeared on the scene after the death of the apostles but never gained dominance over the slave Never turn the slave to disloyalty to Jehovah or to false teaching. Why do they need story number one? Why do they need to tell the great apostasy fairy tale? The great apostasy teaching is necessary in order to explain or to explain away all the problems with the organization, the false prophecies, the pagan pyramid teachings, the early celebration of holidays, the early use of the cross, doctrinal flip-flops, etc., they can blame all these things on the long years of apostasy and on Christendom. After all, it takes time to restore the truth. Rome wasn't built in a day. Okay, why do they need story number two? Elementary, my dear Watson, there had to be a loyal slave around in 1914 for Jesus to reward and appoint. Otherwise, they were just a part of vile Christendom. Also, they need validation. They don't want to appear just another 19th century Johnny-come-lately religion. You know, they have to have some connection with Jesus and the apostles in the first century. So they need story number two. Let's look at these two stories and see how they fit together. <laughs> the F and D slave has been in continuous existence down through church history, though its identity may have been unclear. Okay, that's one of the premises. And this is a statement from the March 1, 1981 Watchtower, page 24. By the way, I have all this documentation. I have uh, about 20 of them at my table if anybody's interested in, in having it. 
And I also did an article on this, The Wheat in the Weeds, so in case I forget to communicate something, you, you guys could pick up one of those too. Beginning with Pentecost, 33 CE, and continuing through the 19th century since then, this slave-like congregation has been feeding its members spiritually, doing so faithfully and discreetly. Especially has the identity of this slave become clear at the time of Christ's return or presence. Okay, so it's been in, in existence the whole time. Note, not only was the slave in continuous existence, but he fed the flock faithfully and discreetly. This slave-like congregation has been feeding its members spiritually. So all down through the centuries, the slave was in existence and he was feeding, uh, he was feeding the flock. The slave has always been a group, not individuals scattered here and there. This is from the March 1, 1981 Watchtower, page 24. Witnesses of Jehovah understand that the slave is comprised of all the anointed Christians as a group on earth at any given time during the 19th century since Pentecost. The slave would remain loyal. Shortly after Jesus' resurrection and ascension to heaven, he formed the Christian congregation on Pentecost Day of the year 33 CE. There the faithful and discreet slave class, with Jesus' apostles taking the lead, began to feed the individuals. So here we've got the group, the organization, feeding the individuals, much like today, um, in God's newly formed household of faith with spiritual food. The slave class, the spirit-anointed Christian congregation, would remain loyal right down to the time of Christ's coming to destroy the present wicked system of things. So the slave was going to remain loyal. The evil slave would never gain dominance over the slave. Christ would not let any such disloyal ones have domin dominance over or break up his congregation and stop the work it is doing. That's the February 15, 1975 Watchtower, page 110. The slave not only, the slave fed not only itself, but also each succeeding generation from Pentecost until now. The January 15th, 1975 Watchtower says on page 46, Jesus has said, look, I am with you all the days until the conclusion of this system of things, Matthew 28, 20. Jesus Christ is the head of the congregation, his slave, and his words show that he would strengthen them to feed his domestics right down through the centuries. Apparently, one generation of the slave class fed the succeeding generation thereof as well as continuing to feed themselves. No individual could have provided so well. But with family effort, all are well fed. As a family, and that emphasis was in their publication, they are one body just as the faithful and discreet slave. So what are they saying? They're saying that one generation fed the next, you know, that's the, all the way down through the century. The organization dates back to the first century. This is from You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth, 1982, page 193. If you were a true worshiper of Jehovah in the first century, you had to be part of his Christian organization. This is because a lot of times they'll want to deny that. And they'll, they'll want to deny that there's always been an organization in continuous existence when they're on one of the stories. The, state, the slave's food is progressive and the light always gets brighter and brighter. This is also very important because they want to say somehow the light went out. And it says the light on the path of Jehovah's ser servants from the earliest time to the present has kept on increasing. December 1, 1981, Watchtower, page 26. The slave's food is progressive. Oh, that's the same. Okay. <coughs> Down through the years, the slave-like congregation has been feeding its true members faithfully and discreetly from Pentecost, A.D. 33, up until this very present hour, this has been lovingly and carefully performed. Yes, and these domestics have been fed on progressive spiritual food that keeps them abreast of the bright light that is getting lighter and lighter until the day is firmly established. All this has been proved to be food at the proper time as stated by Jesus. That's the July 15th, 1960 Watchtower, page 435. Notice, all the way down through the centuries, they kept getting new light. Wouldn't you think, then, 
with all the faithful feeding going on for all those centuries, that the light would have been fully established, exceedingly firmly established by maybe six, seven hundred or so. You know, no, but according to story number one, the slave by 700 A.D. was in very deep weeds. Okay, the slave reappears. The July 15, 1960 Watchtower states on page 435, from the 1870s onward, the thin line of true Christians began to come to historic view again as in the days of the first century. The thin line? Weren't they a group? Didn't each generation feed the next? Didn't they get new light and they stayed a group and they fed the individuals and one generation fed the next? So why did they say that they were a thin line? This is important. The slave has now come back into view. If story number two has any truth in it at all, and the slave has indeed existed all down through the centuries as wheat, one generation feeding the next, they will be loyal, they will be a group, and their teachings would have been progressively getting brighter all down through history. Yet amazingly, the society denies this and informs us that the slave was not a group but was made up of scattered individuals who were part of Christendom, the weeds. A decided move was made by many of the weak group to disassociate themselves from the many weed-like sects of Christendom. July 15, 1960, Washtenaw, page 435. Now, this creates a real problem. Why would the wheat, the slave, need to disassociate itself from Christendom? When did the slave become associated with Christendom? How did they become associated with the weeds. Hadn't they stayed loyal? Remember, they stayed loyal. How could they have become associated with the weeds? Story number two demands it. Um, after, after speaking of the faithful and discreet slave that would be loyal till his coming, we note that Jesus did not say that the faithful and discreet slave would turn disloyal. Jehovah God will have only loyal ones tested as inheritors of the kingdom. February 15th, 1975, Watchtower, page 110. So here we go again. They're reiterating. The slave was loyal. The slave had scattered. This gathered group of Christians from many parts of the earth formed a new association that later came to be known as Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the Watchtower, July 15th, 1960, page 435. The slave had scattered. Why would the slave class need to be gathered? When had it gotten scattered? Remember that the society says that the loyal slave was always a group, never individuals, and that Jehovah God does not ever work with individuals or give them any light on the scriptures. He always and only works through organization. If you know anything about the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know that. God only works through his organization. Individuals, you can't out there... Uh, read your Bible and learn the truth. You have to have the organization. Um, logically, then, if they were individuals, they were not the faithful and discreet slave. And if they were any part of Christendom, they also were eliminated of be- as being the slave because we cannot be a part of God's organization and at the same time be part of false religion. You can live forever in paradise on earth, page 202. So that, so much for Wycliffe and Tyndale and, and those, they couldn't possibly be the slave. They couldn't possibly be true Christians or true wheat because they were a part of false religion. The slave was a disloyal apostate whose light had not gotten brighter but had gone out and needed to be restored. Yes, the domestics or individual anointed ones were being spiritually revived with increasingly Restored Light of Bible Truth by the Collective Slave Group, July 15, 1960, Watchtower, page 435. The Collective Slave Group revived its members with restored light. How did the Collective Slave, scattered as it was, get revived in order to revive the others, the individuals? Where did the restored light come from? Who could revive the slave once he had fallen into apostasy and become just another weed? No different from the rest of Christendom. What about Russell? 
you know, that's that's sometimes that they want to switch gears and, you know, they want to talk about, you know, well, Russell really started it. There really was no, you know, they'll try to disregard all of the speaking about the slave always existing and they'll want to say that Russell started it and he was uh, given the light by God. He was not the founder of a new religion. He revived the great truth taught by Jesus. He made no claim of special revelation by God but held that it was God's due time for the Bible to be understood, and that, being fully consecrated to the Lord and to his service, he was permitted to understand it. This is Jehovah's Witnesses in the Divine Purpose, 1959, page 17. Could C.T. Russell have restored and revived the light of truth? Could he, as a fully consecrated individual, have read the Bible and discovered these lost truths and gathered together the slave individuals and taught them? Could he? No, because no individual can possibly understand the scriptures without the slave. So no, because according to the Watchtower, no individual can understand it, and God never works through individuals. He always uses an organization. So when I talk to Jehovah's Witnesses about this, I'll ask them, well, did Russell found the organization? And if they say yes, then I'll show, you know, then I'll prove to them that that can't be true. If they, if they take the tack about the faith, you know, if I've told them about the, the loyal organization and they try to take that tack, you know, then I'll ha make them defend that and show them that that's not what the Watchtower teaches. They, they can't win. It doesn't matter to me which one they choose to defend, which story, because both of the stories are equally false. So it doesn't really matter. Besides individually possessing God's word, we need a theocratic organization. Yes, besides having God's spirit of illumination, a Christian needs Jehovah's theocratic organization in order to understand the Bible. The Watchtower, June 15, 1951, page 375. That would sort of eliminate Russell, in my opinion. The Bible is an organizational book and belongs to the Christian congregation as an organization, not to individuals, regardless of how sincerely they may believe they can interpret the Bible. So Russell believed he could interpret the Bible, but this says it doesn't matter how sincerely they believe it, they can't. They have to have the organization. That's the Watchtower, October 1st, 1967, page 587. If there was an F and D slave organization in Russell's day, he rejected it. He hated religious organizations. There, in his, his words, out of the Zion's Watchtower, September 1st, 1893, page 266, there is no organization today clothed with such divine authority to imperiously command mankind. So think about that. Okay, they say that you have to have an organization, there was always an organization, there was always a slave, there was the F and D slave existed all the way down to the years, and he didn't know of any organization. He, Russell didn't know of any, and he rejected organization as being the way. In fact, in another place, and I don't have this up here, he says, beware of organization. You don't need organization. All you need is the Bible and your conscience, and of course him, <laughs> you know, but... He hated organizations. So that would prove the fairy tale right there. The wheat slave did survive and shone as brightly as the sun. Would Satan entirely succeed with no wheat left after the master's absence of 1900 years? Jesus confidently answers that question in the, in the above reference to illustration of the sower by saying, just as the weeds are collected and burned with fire, so it will be in the consummation of the system of things. At that time, the righteous ones will shine as brightly as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So it was indicated that many of the weak class of righteous ones, anointed ones, would survive here on earth up to and during the time of the end. July 15, 1960, Watchtower, page 435. So, if the slave has indeed been scattered and has long been a part and parcel of weedy Christendom, he would have to be burned along with the rest of the weeds. Why does the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society call the weedy slave righteous and shining? It was just a weed, just like the rest. The slave was an awake spiritual watchman, <coughs> excuse me, with unclean garments from long association with Christian apostasy. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Under the direction of this religious corporation of the of the great worldwide campaign, oh, got to tell my throat. To announce the 1914 end of the Times of the Nations was undertaken, as mentioned earlier. The Watchtower Witnesses of Jehovah proved to be awake spiritual watchmen, but the scriptures describe them as having unclean garments because of their long association with Christian apostasy. Okay, so here we, this is ridiculous. This statement alone is ridiculous on the face of it. They were awake spiritual watchmen. They proved to be awake spiritual watchmen. They were spiritual, they were awake. But the scriptures describe them as having unclean garments because of their long association with Christian apostasy. Huh? (laughs) A little slow in coming up. Just how long of an association did the slave have with weedy Christendom? How many generations ago had the slave lost his light? And by the way, what is Christian apostasy? I mean, according to the Watchtower, you're not, you're a Christian, or you're an apostate, which means you're a Jehovah's Witness, or you're an apostate, or you're part of evil Christendom. There's no Christian apostasy. That's just another way they're trying to schmooze over the problem. The slaves' practices and beliefs were similar to weedy Christendom. Thanks. They had many practices, characteristics, and beliefs similar to the weed-like sects of Christendom. So from 1914 to 1918, a period of fiery testing came upon them, not unlike the ancient period of Babylonish captivity of the Jews back in 607 to 537 B.C. That's July 15, 1960, Watchtower, page 436. Okay, ancient Israel, when they were sent to Babylon, what was it for? Blatant apostasy. Idol worship. The Watchtower Society always teaches that apostates make up the evil slave, but here they are telling us that the ever-loyal F&D slave was made up, up of a bunch of apostates, too. The slave was worldly, unclean, polluted, and weed-like. So Jehovah reproached the slave and sent him into Babylonish captivity. And all this came to pass in connection with transgression on their part in having the fear of man, not conducting themselves in a strictly neutral way during the war years, and being tainted with many religiously unclean practices. July 15, 1960, Watchtower, page 436. Are these apostates the righteous ones that shine like the sun? The slave was, did I do that? I already read that one. Go ahead. Jehovah and Jesus Christ permitted these witnesses to be reproached, persecuted, banned, and their officers in prison by the nations of this old world. Notice, however, this is pretty funny. Notice, however, that this watchman's voice was not stilled until they had completed their pre-1914 phenomenal work of warning the peoples of the nation. July 15, 1960, Watchtower, page 436. Now, if you remember what Keith was talking about this morning, what were they warning the people of in 1914? The end of the world. They were, it was the end of the world. Why was the slave, what was the slave prophesy, uh, prophesizing before 1914? The slave was warning the people of the nations that Armageddon was to occur in 1914. Why would God wait until they had finished broadcasting this false prophecy before taking them off into captivity? Did Jehovah have to wait and see if it would turn out to be right? (laughs) Maybe, because with their Jehovah, he's very limited. Okay, the slave was restored yet again in 1919. As we now know, this watchman class of the faithful and discreet slave was being cleansed for still greater watchman service in the turbulent years to follow their restoration in 1919. July 15, 1960, Watchtower, page 436. Hadn't the slave already been restored in the 1870s? How many times does the slave need to be restored? Why would a loyal slave ever need to be restored? 
Okay, and why did they insist on calling this apostate slave faithful and discreet? Didn't they just say that he was polluted and he had dirty garments and he had long association with Christendom and, and now they're saying he was faithful and discreet? What is this double talk? And that's exactly what it is, it's double talk. The slave was sent into captivity because they held many false doctrines. The book, Jehovah's Witnesses and Divine Purpose, on page 91, explains why the slave was sent off into Babylonish captivity in this way. By the way, I call it the baloneyish captivity. <laughs> because it's just another fairy tale. There were many false doctrines and practices that had not been cleaned out of the organization. With considerably misunderstanding, they had accepted earthly political governments as the superior authorities that God had ordained according to Romans 13.1. Isn't that what they teach today? Yeah. And yet they said that's why they were sent to Babylonian captivity. Okay, the Bible speaks. Who really is that slave whom the master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? Happy is that slave if his master, upon arriving, finds him doing so. Truly I say to you, he will appoint him over all his belongings. That's a New World uh, Translation, Matthew 24, 45. You know, looking at that text, how many years does the master give the slave to clean up his act? How many years? It says, upon arriving. Does it say that a slave found unfaithful upon the master's arrival would nevertheless be rewarded? Okay, now this is about the evil slave. But if the evil slave should say in his heart, my master is delaying and should beat his fellow slaves and should eat and drink with the confirmed drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect and an hour that he does not know and will punish him with the greatest severity and will assign him his part with the hypocrites. This is where his weeping and gnashing of his teeth will be. This is the New World Translation, Matthew 24, 48 through 51. Okay, from this text, does it seem that the evil slave presumed to know, but truly had no clue when the master was returning? Looks that way to me. He was, he thought his master had was delaying. Does the evil slave abusive behavior remind you of any slave you know? <laughs> Think so. Yes. Was the evil slave sent to Babylon or someplace much worse? Doesn't look like Babylon to me. Okay, and then the most important, where does it say that the evil slave was released and restored, much less appointed over all the master's belonging? Does it say that the evil slave was released after his punishment? No, it wasn't released. It's certainly not restored. It's certainly not appointed over all the master's possessions. Okay, the slave was brought back from captivity and rewarded with new lofty service, even though, and this is my aside, even though they continued in the same pagan practices long after 1919. A faithful remnant of some thousands of the domestics of the faithful and discreet slave class survived this time of testing. From the spring of 1919 forward, they began to rise from the dust of inactivity to their new lofty service as watchmen to the world. July 15, 1960, Watchtower, page 436. Why would God grant them a new lofty service when the slaves celebrated pagan birthdays, pagan holidays, used the cross, uh, worshipped Charles Taze Russell, uh, even talked to him after he was dead. They thought they were communicating with him. They didn't know who Jesus was. I mean, after all, today they teach that he's Michael, and they didn't believe that then, and continued to presume to know and falsely prophesy when the master would return. Why would, why would he reward them and then they continue to do that? No sooner had the slave gotten out of captivity that the slave erected a nine-foot pyramid at Charles Russell's gravesite in 1919, right after they were released from Babylon. We went there and took those pictures. You can tell it's the fall it was when we were coming to this convention and we have our pictures. We have a picture of us hanging on our wall sitting by the pyramid. That's in, it's near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Somebody here could probably give you the exact directions if you wanted to go there. 
And I can also give pictures to anybody that wants them, because I took pictures and I have them. Pagan pyramid this way. <laughs> the slave was rich in loyalty and integrity and strong in his ancient faith and obedient, which is why it was rewarded with kingdom service, which Jehovah surely would not leave in the hands of a novice organization of spiritual babes. Now that the long-expected kingdom had become an established reality in heaven, surely its growing interest on earth after 1919 would not be left in the hands of a novice organization of spiritual babes, and that proved to be true. It was a 1,900-year-old faithful and discreet slave, the old Christian congregation that was entrusted with this precious kingdom service. July 15, 1960, Watchtower, page 436. Do you see the baloney here? This faithful 1,900-year-old slave had apostatized some unspecified number of years prior to its restoration, although we still have no idea how any restoration was possible with no one unapostatized to teach the others. Can one learn the truth without the organization? No, cannot. we got to remember that one. Rich in its... In its uh, Okay, rich in its loyalty and integrity, long in its patient suffering of per persecution, strong in its ancient faith in Jehovah's precious promises, confident in the leadership of its invisible Lord, Jesus Christ, obedient in its centuries-old commission to be witnesses in the earth, finally cleansed by a fiery test in 1918, the matured slave, as represented by the remnant, now stood ready for new assignments of service. July 15th, 1960, Watchtower, page 436. Rich in loyalty? They've got to be joking. These are the same bunch of apostates who associated with Christendom for centuries. You know, don't, don't let them ever, don't let them ever uh, talk to you about the Inquisition or the Crusades or anything without asking them where the faithful and discreet slave was during that time and what he was doing because he was right in there with Christendom, right? If he existed, he was part of Christendom. Why would the loyal, obedient, faithful slave have to be finally cleansed? The language even is, is absolutely ludicrous. Okay, now what exactly is loyalty? Because sometimes the Jehovah's Witness will try to get around it by, by you know, trying to mystify loyalty. So we, I thought that I would use the, uh, the Watchtower's own definition of loyalty, and we can apply it to the slave and see if the slave was loyal. The March 15, 1996 Watchtower on page 15 states, Loyalty to Jehovah God will also keep us from doing anything that would bring reproach upon his name and kingdom. Loyalty to God also involves not yielding to the fear of man. Thus, we do not compromise when faced with persecution. If we are loyal to Jehovah God, we will avoid making friends with his enemies. Loyalty to Jehovah's organization means having nothing to do with apostates. If the slave existed all down through the centuries, as taught in story number two, he certainly was not loyal to Jehovah. The slave compromised the truth. He brought reproach on the name and kingdom. He made friends with God's enemies. And as far as having nothing to do with apostates, they joined Christendom. They were a part of Christendom. According to the Watchtower Society, the faithful and discreet slave was, we're going to recap here, founded by Jesus Christ in 33 CE, founded by Russell in the 1870s, a cohesive group, not scattered individuals, a few individuals scattered among Christendom, an organization. God never works through individuals, nor can anyone understand the Bible without the organization. C.T. Russell, who recognized no organization whom God worked through to restore the truth. And if you recall, C.T. Russell was the faithful and discreet slave. They even they admit that today. The slave was loyal, and the evil slave did not gain dominance over them. The slave was disloyal, part of weedy Christendom, which thoroughly dominated them. The slave fed not only itself, but succeeding generations. Each generation in turn fed the next. All were well fed. The slave was unable to feed anyone, since he was scattered soon after the death of the apostles, becoming part of false religion. 
The slave continually receives progressive light that always gets brighter and brighter. The slave was in total darkness. His light blinked out and needed to be restored. The slave was revived and his light restored in the late 19th century. The slave was hopelessly lost since there was no cohesive F&D slave organization to revive and restore him. The slave was righteous at Christ's return in 1914 and shone as bright as the sun. The slave was deeply entrenched in Christendom's weedy beliefs and practices. The slave was rich in loyalty and integrity and strong in its ancient faith, which is why he was re rewarded by and appointed by Christ at his return. The slave was unclean, with polluted garments from long association with Christian apostasy. So Christ sent him into Babylonish captivity. We have learned that the slave was released from Babylonish captivity in 1919 and given even greater privileges now that he was finally cleansed. And the slave, immediately upon his release from captivity, built a huge stone pyramid at Russell's grave site and continued to lead the flock into pagan ideas and practices long after 1919. Okay, the slave was 1,900 plus years old when entrusted with kingdom interests. No, the slave was a novice organization of spiritual babes. The slave was faithful and discreet weak to be heard and obeyed. The slave was just another weed to be pulled up and burned. The slave was far superior to Christendom and has the moral capital to stand in judgment of her. The slave was merely a part of Christendom and has no room to talk. The slave is fibbing about its history. The slave should win an Oscar for impersonating a Christian group. <laughs> okay, now what difference does this make? You know, it, it, you look at it all and you can see their line. One thing it does, it shows the organization to be blatantly dishonest. I take both of these stories. And I put them side by side, and no matter what they try to, which story they try to argue, I'll show them the story that shows them the other side. And then they'll try to revert back to the other story, and I'll show them that, you know. And so there's, it shows the dishonesty, and there's no real way that they can get out of it. It demolishes the organization's authority. Why is that? Because the slave was not appointed. The slave, when the master arrived, was punished and sent into Bologna's captivity. So that he was never um, appointed, so we don't have to listen to him. And neither did Jehovah's Witnesses. It removes the holier-than-thou mantle. Like I was saying before, when Jehovah's Witnesses want to talk about what Christendom did and, you know, go on and on about that, I'll always just bring back the slave. What was the slave doing during all those centuries? It destroys the new light excuse. Because either the light got brighter and brighter and brighter, like they say, from the time of Christ until now, in which case there's no room for pyramids and, you know, pagan stuff, phrenology and chronology and anesthesiology or any of that other stuff. And it just undermines the Bible is an organizational book assertion. Because if Russell could be led, if Russell could be um, helped to understand the scriptures because he was consecrated or whatever, then so could any other individual do the same thing. We don't need the organization to understand the Bible. It's obvious. And it gives you something else to talk to JWs about when they come to your door. And like I also said, you can use it in so many different facets. You know, no matter kind of which way they, they, uh, they go, you can always discuss the other side with them. Okay, and I would, I would also say a few other things. The, the question thing that Keith was talking about, I agree with that a thousand percent. I know Wilbur Lingle does that too, where you ask questions because that really makes them answer it. Even if they don't answer it out loud, they still have to answer it in their heart. You know, so when you use questions like that and kind of go through it with them, they know in their heart, no matter what they, what they try to show you. And then I say also, pray diligently for them forever. You know, I'm still praying for Jehovah's Witnesses, not only my original friends that I met on, on the uh, bowling league, but try to write down all the names of the witnesses that I ever have met with 
and continue to pray for them because this is not an immediate thing. You know, a lot of times these people could take years, but lest we become discouraged, we have to think of the examples in the Bible of Abraham and some of those that, you know, they did have to wait. They weren't rewarded immediately. So keep praying for them because God is the God of miracles. And also show them love. You know, obviously they're not getting love in the organization. So if you love them, you can show that to them. Perhaps you can touch their heart in that way. Also, don't get discouraged if you don't see the reaction that that you hope to see. Because so many people in, in, in this audience have told their stories and said that they didn't show the emotions when someone was talking to them. You know, that they kept a straight face, that pride didn't let them, or the other person that was with them, having another person with them did not allow them to show what was really going on. So don't be discouraged by that. Just go ahead and keep praying for them and, and caring for them. And then uh, the last thing is you're not going to do it perfectly. You're not going to know maybe absolutely everything. You're, there's going to be times when you're, when you're going to think that you could have handled it differently or you could have done something differently. All you can do is prepare yourself, do your best, and just leave the rest to God. That's all any of us can do because God is the one that ultimately saves these people. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your salvation so free. We thank you for the fact that you loved us enough to send your son to die for us. We pray for these people that are lost in this organization and other people that we know that are lost. We pray that you'll draw them to yourself and give us opportunities to speak with them. We also pray, Lord, that you will increase our love for the Jehovah's Witnesses, for Mormons, for other lost people. And renew our passion for these people because sometimes it gets so long and sometimes, you know, it can be so discouraging in this ministry. And, Lord, we also pray for the strength of the battle. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.